Well, welcome everyone to tonight's intimate conversation. My name is Ariel Jones and I am the development director here at Mocha GA. And I am very, very proud and excited to present to you um, artist Eric Kaplinger and his exhibition, Vinegars. Um, Eric and I have a personal relationship and as well as being coworkers. I've been here for three and a half years and Eric always comes to my rescue when I have almost set the building on fire. So he is my own personal savior and it's been a wonderful privilege to be able to see him come alive and exist as a working artist and creating this wonderful body of work that we are graced with at this time. Um, Eric is an artist that lives and works in Atlanta where he has been the chief preparator for Mocha GA for the last nine years. Eric is a mixed media artist with a strong influence in drawing. Whether the work comes from history, the abstract, or personal experience, his expression deals with pot potential adventure, the energy all around our daily lives, and soul quenching experience. So I am so excited to listen to Eric and, you know, see how your process goes and how you work. <laughs> thank you, Ariel. Um, I'd like to thank all the staff at Mocha GA here. Um, it's great working with you all and been a huge help in organizing this exhibition and allowing it to come to life and be something to really be proud of on my end. Um, I guess when I thought about how I wanted to discuss this exhibition, um, it kind of is interesting for me because it stretches back to like early childhood and adolescence and then kind of everything up until now. Um, so I was kind of gonna start, you know, back in time you know, my family moved to Colorado when I turned 10 years old. And, uh, you know, that, that made a big imprint on, you know, who I've become to be as an adult and even as an artist. Um, you know, it was a huge change moving from the uh, suburbs of Chicago um, to a tiny little mountain town right outside Rocky Mountain National Park called uh, Estes Park. And, um, my parents were always very encouraging about pushing my, you know, artistic endeavors. Um, growing up, my two loves were baseball and making artwork. Um, and when it came to artwork, they would get me into like the art center and get me into art classes. But in Estes Park, the only thing that existed was plain air painting and art making. You know, going out into the national park and painting, you know, from life, you know, the landscapes and the animals. Um, and so that, I guess, you know, really kind of imprinted on me, even though I was never really driven to, to go that route, you know, there was the plain air painting, there was big bronze sculptures of elk, there was chainsaw art, um, art of like, you know, carving bears out of logs and uh, fun things like that. But I remember taking a plain air painting class out, you know, in the mountains. And um, the one thing that really, like, got to me and was a huge challenge was, um, like, depicting mountains and, like, the infinite detail involved in a mountain and the grandiosity um, and how, as an artist, it was, like, just trying to mimic your best in, in like, these quick strokes, like, to capture that. And it always was a... Um, I don't know, it kind of pushed me away from that sort of realistic artwork because I felt like I could never really capture like just the the absolute like endless amount of information in something like a mountain. Um, and so later on, years down the road, I'm not in Colorado anymore. Um, really, it started kind of in Chicago and, and when I moved to Atlanta. But I was making these, um, these pieces out of cut canvas and it was really about texture. And while I was making those, it, um, 
you know, it reminded me so much of a rock face and it felt like I finally got my situation where I was depicting that sort of endless amount of information and um, like infinity in those pieces. These are, these are obviously a bit different. They're clouds and representational um, in a way. But I'm trying to, uh, I guess, explain sort of the precursors to, to where this exhibition oh, came from. Um, a really um, important mentor of mine was Barbara Rossi. She was um, a part of an art group in Chicago called the Chicago Images that um, kind of rose to small fame in the late 60s and early 70s. And she taught this course called Form Invention, which was a drawing class, which really was just about like opening your mind to abstract thought um, finding value in like your own sort of inventions in artwork, um, like trying to really focusing on s unique, trying to find a unique way of depicting something, inventing how um, something might look. Um, it just sort of opened my mind to a, a type of creativity that I had always been searching for up to that point. Like it kind of gave me an avenue into developing my own language as an artist and it kind of was you know the start of all this line work that you see in these pieces uh, in these pieces um, and to me that language as uh, Ariel kind of um, talked about in the introduction is like me trying to depict the energy and like um, endless possibilities of every second during life you know we try and kind of avoid those possibilities and like we like to try and keep things you know uh, the same and predictable um, but there is always you know that possibility that everything can change in the next minute um, maybe it's really good maybe it's really bad maybe you know it's somewhere in between um, but in my art making like it was always really important for me to try and find a language that kind of explained or expressed that uh, undercurrent of energy of life on, you know, as we go about our daily lives. Um, and especially in a show like this where it's really about getting out into the world and experiencing the expanse of nature, um, challenging yourself, um, witnessing, you know, wildlife and appreciate and finding appreciation for that and a romanticism for that even um and uh so now you know i would like to talk about why you know i titled the show vinegars um i've already gotten a lot of questions from people like at the opening how that kind of applies to this um and so i wanted to kind of read off this list of uh synonyms for the word vinegar um, from Webster's Dictionary. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and start with beans, bounce, brio, dash, drive, dynamism, energy, a spirit, gas, get up and go, ginger, go, gusto, hardihood, juice, life, moxie, oomph, pep, punch, sap, snap, starch, verve, vigor, vim, vitality, zing, and zip. Like when I read those those were like, you know, descriptors that I wanted attached to my work. They all kind of made sense for, um, you know, the kind of energy that I try and imbue in my drawings or the, the textured sculpture. You know, it's always about like, you know, an undercurrent of energy for me. Um, and I had been on a, a trip with my girlfriend up to the North Georgia mountains where we were passing a farmer's market and they had signs, you know, for raw honey and, I don't uh, peaches probably. And, but one of the signs said vinegars. And I just got a kick out of plural vinegars just reading it off a sign on the highway. And I started using it in language, you know, in sort of like this inside joke way with my girlfriend. And we were, um, without knowing, you know, these synonyms of vinegars had started attaching a meaning of like energy Like we go rock climbing together and you know, if we really poured ourselves out in the gym We would say oh my vinegars are empty and uh, You know have fun with it that way So then when I researched more into the you know the term it was like oh my goodness it kind of really pulls everything, you know that I had in mind for this exhibition into a title um, 
And so that was sort of my explanation um, for how I came to name the show. It, it really just was a, a, you know, a, a stand-in for energy. Um, and that felt perfect for me. Um, I'm going to go into, I guess, talk about some of the individual works. Um, I might just start with the clouds on the left because it really, um, for the last 10 years, my work mainly focused on this sort of wall sculpture texture work where I'm just uh, cutting canvas into these doing the same thing I was doing in form invention with drawing, but instead it's in, you know, shapes of canvas. I'm just cutting endless amounts of interesting, unique shapes. Each one I try and make, you know, different from the last. Um, and then I start building them onto a piece um, to create these sculptures. And it, they, in a way, they were always drawings to me because they are based in, in the line still for me. Um, but I would say about five years ago, my work was getting to a, a challenging place for me where I felt like it was getting to into, the, into some dark subjects that was making me uncomfortable. And I thought, I'm going to make a piece for my daughter because I'd never, she was four or five years old at the time and I hadn't made anything for her as of yet. I'd, I'd built her some things, but I'd never made a piece of artwork um, in my own style for her. And I thought, you know, it would be great to just do like a fun cloud for her bedroom. Um, and that was sort of like, it was a beautiful thing that I, when I was done, I thought, wow, I took, you know, something that I had been working on and, and, and made, you know, a new path for myself in trying to, to create a gift for my daughter. And so over the last five years, I've continued to make the clouds. Um, and then when it came to creating this exhibition and thinking about it and like planning on it, I thought like the clouds would be a great bridge from the more textural, sculptural work that I had been doing and bringing it over into um, the newer work, which is primarily drawing. Um, so yeah, those are the cotton candy clouds. They're just like a fun, uh, delightful feeling of work for me. And uh, I don't know, you know, clouds are, they ha you know, have a lot of different meaning for different people. I can remember my first cloud that I drew was like this Ninja Turtle scene when I was like six years old, back when, you know, I would make the clouds blue so the rest of the sky could be just the white. Um, you know, the, it, it, and growing up and looking in clouds and find, finding animals in them in different shapes and it just, it to me is just like a really positive um, and, and light sort of subject matter for me that kind of uh, works really well for in my thoughts with this exhibition. Then, if I'm going to move on, um, the w street behind everyone, there's a small drawing in the middle with uh, it's got the blue sky and the graphite mountain. That was the first drawing I did for this exhibition, and it was a brand new um, discovery, really. Um, I had been experimenting with powdered graphite for a few years, um, but then I, I had this snap line chalk in my studio, like for carpenters and building houses. Um, and I thought, you know, I could just rub this into the paper the same way I'm doing with um, the graphite and start to build a landscape out of it. Because they had, I had been really abstract for a long time and non, not representational much at all. Um, but when I added the blue chalk to that piece and built that piece um, using that, it, it just, it screamed landscape to me. And immediately I thought back in my childhood in Colorado, sort of invented like this little mountain scene. Um, and it really, it had so much like contrast and energy and it got me really excited. And it kind of spawned all the, you know, the drawings uh, included in the rest of the show. So I named that one Vinegar's after the, the rest of the exhibition, but then I moved into these sort of more uh, medium-sized drawings, um, and each one of them kind of has like a personal connection 
uh, to my adolescence, family, memories, um, love, that sort of thing. If I move from the, the left to the right, this one's called uh, Chuckum's Peak. And Chuckum's was uh, the nickname of my youngest brother, Charlie. Um, and he was always this daredevil of a little boy and, and growing up into teenage years. Like he had no fear, would ski down, you know, huge mountains without taking a single turn, you know, climbed really pretty challenging advanced climbs, you know, as like a 12, 13 year old uh, kid. And he's always kind of wowed me in that way. And so I wanted to dedicate a piece, um, you know, to his nature and his spirit in this show. And then directly after that is uh, one named for my uh, middle brother, Brian, who is a tour guide now in Rocky Mountain National Park and has his own company giving personalized and custom tours um, to visitors and tourists out in Estes Park, Colorado. And so, you know, he started this all on his own. And so I kind of made, you know, a piece that reflects, uh, you know, my love for both my brothers and, you know, uh, thinking about them and the landscape in Colorado and and just sort of working from memory they're invented landscapes again it's not like portraying anywhere in colorado or georgia or or anywhere um they're just sort of compositions that really worked well for me and i continued with the adding the chalk is sort of like the the atmosphere and then the powdered graphite and uh there's white charcoal pencil and acrylic uh white pen as well down the canyon um, just reminds me of growing up and when we first moved to Colorado we had to drive through this long windy canyon up the mountains and it was you know coming from Chicago as a kid it was just it was incredible like I couldn't believe like these you know towering rock walls surrounding us and the little river along the side of the road um, and that was my you know my first first memory from of moving out there and was always a powerful thing to me um, then over here we have a bighorn sheep piece and whenever we were driving through town or going anywhere my mom would always say I'll give you a dollar if you guys see a bighorn sheep um, which is a lot of fun as a kid you want to you want to get some money they're also like really hard to spot because they just blend in and they're way up on the cliffs you know you really have to keep an eye out for them but they're amazing animals and um, you know so I was inspired to do um, that piece sort of in honor of of that animal if we move on to the elk um, when we did it's another early like right as we moved to Colorado like impression that I had um, it was during rutting season for the elk so the bulls are doing all sorts of bugling like trying to attract the females or keep their herd together and uh, it's a it's to me it was just a wild sound as a kid it sounds like an elephant almost except like really brassy and I would the first time I heard it I was just laying in bed like inside my house and it was just right outside the door <laughs> and it's like what in the world is that sound um, and uh, you know we would used to there used to be herds of like a hundred of them blocking the road when we'd be trying to go anywhere um, and they were just a constant part of life growing up in the mountains there. Um, so I wanted to do a piece that really kind of harkened back to those memories and, and the appreciation there. Then with the coyotes, um, I was remembering a time I was working landscape maintenance for the Parks and Recreation Department and uh, was cutting grass. And there was all these coyotes howling like really close to me. I couldn't see them. They were like probably behind some trees and down a hill a little bit. But um, they have a really kind of um, ominous and, and frightening sound when they're all hackling together. Um, you know, it's like a, like a pack of hyenas or something. They usually do it after they make a kill. Um, they'll also do it as like a, a group ritual of, of welcome each other, you know, back into their group. Um, and I remember, you know, when I was doing that job, I had to be there at 5.30 in the morning. So I was out on my own cutting grass, and I heard all these coyotes howling and hackling. And I had one of my bosses raced up to come find me because he thought 
that maybe they had like taken me down or something. They don't attack especially adult humans. They might go after like if there was a child on its own. Usually they're going to be terrified of humans. Um, but I thought it was pretty funny um, that he thought I had been attacked by the coyotes and came to see if I was okay. Um, but this also, you know, reminds me I'm a father of two daughters and, you know, it's like a, a, a parent coyote kind of teaching its, its pups how to how to make their way in the world a little bit and communicate and uh, passing information down as I do as a father. Um, and then moving on from that, the piece to the left of that is me with my two daughters, Effie and Ayla. Um, and this piece is more about the future um, than memory for me. Um, it's about, you know, we're looking away from the viewer. We're kind of looking towards, you know, the next step and just being together as family. When I was uh, 18, my dad found this little tiny lake on the backside of Long's Peak, which is the tallest mountain in Rocky Mountain National Park. And it, ha it was called Keplinger Lake. It's not spelled the same as my last name, but Keplinger just in general is so rare that we made a big deal out of it. Um, and so he had the idea of we could hike up to this little, you know, little Keplinger Lake when you turn 18. It's sort of a ritual of ushering into adulthood. And it's a pretty major hike. It's way above tree line. Um, and the last like six miles of it, there's no trail. So you're just backpacking and using a compass and map and, and trying to fit, uh, make your way up there. And I'm the oldest of my three brothers. So, you know, we were the first ones to go and had to make, <laughs> had to figure out how to get up there the first time um, together. And so I've, you know, I've told both of my daughters when they turn 18, you know, I want to take them up to Keplinger Lake as well. So, and they're, they, they really remember me telling them that because they bring it up like once a month. Um, even though I've told them, you got to <laughs> wait till you're 18 and they're nine and five years old. Um, but I'm really looking forward to the, the opportunity to, to one day take them on that trip as well and, you know, show them all the landscape that really inspired me as a adolescent and teenager and going into my adulthood. Uh, so that is, I think, everything that I wanted to say. If there are any questions or if anyone else wanted to talk about something, I'd be happy to answer some questions. I mean, it really depends. Some of them, like the elk one actually like just kind of, it was the last piece I made for this exhibition and I was really kind of in the groove of things and things really kind of came together even though it was not what I planned at all. It really, um, this, that probably took like three weeks. The other two, you know, were over a month and took a lot of learning and pushing materials and figuring things out and getting the composition how I wanted it. Because I'm, I'm constantly trying to like invent new ways of using uh, the materials that I use. So I, in these bigger um, panels, I started, I was, kind of mixing graphite and water into like a watercolor and drawing that way um, and just and just trying to push everything like there's a lot with an eraser um, and uh, you know the I hadn't worked in a larger size in quite a while it's definitely not new to me but it, it had been um, quite a while and I hadn't done a drawing this large I don't think ever so um, you know, it really just depends. I, I, uh, sometimes it comes out quick, but sometimes it's, <laughs> it's painstaking. The sound? Um, not so much. It was more like, you know, a possible moon overhead um, and the way that that can, you know, cast like illuminations through trees and beams of light and just kind of, it was sort of like a, a spiritual kind of addition as well, kind of add some of that to the piece. Uh, I would say, I mean, like 15 years ago, I would have called myself a painter. Um, but I would say like for the last 10 years, I've been doing more sculptural work like this, which do involve paint. Um, but I wouldn't call those paintings. I 
they're like drawing sculpture hybrids to me but I don't know I I would consider myself a mixed media artist ultimately I guess but I do really enjoy drawing that's like the most natural way for me to work yeah it starts out really um, gestural like you know I took a lot of uh, like figure drawing classes early on where you're trying to capture like just like even just the movement of a figure in like 15 seconds so like the big like quick marks you know kind of uh, usually it, with those it was like um, charcoal um, not so much graphite like these um, but usually just charcoal sticks that you know you can that are nice and dark and can make a quick mark but I guess you know if I'm gonna ex go into like the process of these really it kind of starts with like determining the landscape and I, I usually would start with like the sky in the background and that I'm just like smearing chalk all over the panel and then I take an eraser and draw into it with the eraser and that's sort of the white lines um, and then I'll come in with the graphite and that's graphite powder and just rub in the landscape part of it and then I'm doing the same exact thing with an eraser and drawing just not trying to depict anything or like have any sort of um, real direction at the beginning but I'm just making just making really quick gestural marks all over just trying to make them really kind of like how I cut my canvas just trying to make interesting shapes trying to create some sort of energy um, and then I'll seal it and then come back in with more graphite and then I've got like uh, white charcoal pencils and um, acrylic pens as well that I was using so it's just building up layer after layer and I'm just you know spending time in an area just really letting it come out of me without um, you know a lot of a lot of the areas is like just sort of automatic drawing where I'm just trying to create shapes that I enjoy and look and just excite me and then I start finding points where I can start pulling in some references like with the animals or you know not always you know sometimes it's nice to just do like the you know the mountaintop and I don't need to add any sort of figurative elements to it um, but I guess process wise with these sort of drawings that's what I'm doing it's really kind of putting like a wash down erasing then drawing into it I mean that yeah that can be hard I mean I guess it's just a feeling like some of these like you know they just like I do like I'll fill you know fill the page sometimes and then all of a sudden oh I did everything I needed to do um, and then other times it's like okay there's something off balance wise there's something off like in the way I'm you know understanding this piece that I want you know to convey otherwise so I mean, it, yeah it's that. much of that there were pieces where like early on before like you know the whole series kind of took shape there were pieces that I thought were done and then when I'd make the next piece and that was much more successful in my mind I'm looking at that past piece I'm like okay it's not done it needs to kind of come along with the rest of them um, so yeah there were there were definitely parts where maybe I did think it was done but then I could see in context with everything else that uh, yeah yeah I mean most of them were were direct and um, you know from start to finish I you know started it I wasn't working on other pieces in the middle of it I just was focusing on one piece got done move on to the next one so I'm thinking about the next pieces um, while I'm working on these but um, yeah I don't usually they were pretty direct I would say there was a couple of these pieces where they were it was more just a challenge on how to get this right more so than just continuing to work on it but yeah uh, I knew that I was gonna have an opportunity to have this show back in like the middle of the summer when I was I uh, I hadn't made any of these big ones yet but I was in the midst of creating this show without you know a place to have this exhibition 
Um, so once I knew I had a space, you know, I did just start putting everything I had into it to create more and more work, to create a bigger body of work, make it more interesting. There was more themes popping up. Um, but I didn't know I was going to be in this space until pretty much all the work was done, <laughs> unfortunately. I was working on a couple more clouds um, when I figured out where I was going to be. And at that point, I just needed to frame artwork and get everything ready. Um, but yeah, you know, having, you know, a, a destination at the end is definitely a huge, you know, huge help and, and motivator. I mean, on you know, I'm I'm always inventing the landscapes, but I am thinking about, you know, if I'm going to be depicting something representational, like I want elements of depth and light, and like where the sun might be in the sky, you know, something that is, you know, those are sort of like the last details that go in that are just for like, you know, just. Um, to help the viewer but yeah I, I'm definitely thinking about this as like a real world uh, landscape before you head out and I really want to thank you all for coming I'm super grateful uh, Friday nights aren't usually time for artist talk so I know uh, you know it's a big deal to sacrifice a Friday night to come out here so I appreciate that thanks, thanks.